Hello and welcome to Face to Face. Our guest today is uh, Anthony J. Hall. Professor Hall is Professor of Global Studies at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, welcome, Professor Hall. Hello. And you've just uh, published a second book in... Um, the Bowl with One Spoon. The series is known as The Bowl with One Spoon. So this is volume two in the culminating volume, Earth and Property, Colonization, Decolonization, and Capitalism. You can pick it up at chapters. Um, and so it's, a, it's an immense book. Uh, it's... Uh, over 900 pages. It's McGill Queen's University Press, so it's a peer-reviewed uh, book, and uh, it's volume two of a larger series. Uh, the larger series is called Bowl with One Spoon. Bowl with One Spoon, and yes. I guess the other book in that series is this one. Yes, this is uh, The American Empire in the Fourth World. And together these uh, volumes uh, represent about 16 years of uh, research and writing. When was this one published? This was published in 2005. Okay, and the second one, Earth into Property, is just out now. This is one of the first interviews I've done on, on the new now, book. Now, this is being done uh, just at the beginning of October, so it won't be the first one by the time you see it. I'll just read what um, Naomi Klein says about the first book, The American Empire and the Fourth World, by Anthony J. Hall. Uh, Naomi Klein says, I cannot overstate the importance of this book. If used properly, it could change the world. And then sort of in response to that comment, you can see the helicopters. Now they don't even use helicopters anymore. They have drones with which they kill yes, people. Yes, those of course are, uh, you could picture those as Apache or Black Hawk helicopters. Black Hawk was a man who fought the expansion of the United States into his territory. And uh, he became quite celebrated, as did uh, the famous Apache Geronimo. So I suppose if you fight the expanding American empire, they might, at some future date, name a weapon after you and uh, sort of appropriate your fighting spirit. So that's, the, uh, that's how those helicopters come to appear on the cover of uh, the American empire in the fourth world. But it always gets, uh, by virtue of that, it always gets put in the U.S. political science section. But actually, I'm coming from a position uh, within Canada. I put the story of encounter between indigenous peoples and newcomers in North America at the center of a global story. Uh, I've worked in Native Studies since 1982. And as I was looking at the encounter in Canada and North America and the Western Hemisphere, more and more I appreciate this is a global thing. The, colonization of indigenous peoples happened in Africa, happened in Indochina. In fact, uh, European colonies came to encompass much of the world, so many of the peoples of the world have been colonized. In 1945, there were fi uh, 50 countries recognized at the United Nations. Now we have about 192, I think exactly 192 or 193 if you count the Vatican countries in the world. So most of those countries recognized at the United Nations are formerly colonies of European empires. Including Canada. Including Canada. And of course, Canada is interesting in that it, it emerges from this civil war in British North America where the secessionists you know, left the British Empire to create the United States of America. But on the British side, the British imperial side, that part of the population and the land mass of North America which didn't join the United States, uh, we, you know, we live in, in, in the outgrowth of the conservative side of the American Revolution. And on that conservative side, there was a much uh, more, uh, there was a different approach to the indigenous peoples. Uh, let's do trade, let's do the fur trade, let's make treaties. Uh, that treaty tradition is so strong that you know, it, it didn't jump initially over the, 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 the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they didn't make treaties in British Columbia, but even now there are 50 treaty negotiations, recent treaty negotiations that go back to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And I believe this Royal Proclamation is really the, the key uh, development, the 
key episode that led to the secessionist movement that created the United States. It was really the kind of Indian fighter side, those who were... Uh, okay, so, just a minute. Yeah, yeah. So, because I've never heard this before. I may, actually, when you said it, I thought, yeah, I may have heard that one. So you're saying the Royal Proclamation of 1763 was instrumental in the creation of the United States. I've never heard of yes. the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Uh, let me try to describe it. You're, t now you're just going to describe the Royal Proclamation yeah. of... Yeah, I'm going to try to describe it and why it's so important. Okay, and remember you're talking to people, yes. including myself, who have no idea of what you're about to say, so yeah. keep it simple. So, yeah, of course, uh, you know, the Seven Years' War between Great Britain and France... How would how would uh, North America? Who would who would own North America? Who would uh, who would colonize the territories? Who would transform the lands of North America that into was private property? War between yeah. Would would Britain be the the top dog, or would France be the top dog? So this eventually came to a military clash uh, on the plains of Abraham. The British uh, imperial government emerged as uh, victorious over the people known as the Canadiens. The, and I see the founding people of Canada as Aboriginal and, and French-speaking Catholics, the yeah. Canadiens. Yeah. An Aboriginal Canadian mix is, gives rise to this place called Canada. But after 1759, Canada becomes incorporated in the British Empire. It's no longer French. So then the question arises, how will Canada be governed and how will North America, which is now a, a sort of unified polity under the British imperial government. So what, how will what, it be what governed? What year are we in again? So we're in, we're, you know, before the American Revolution, okay. 1759, the conquest on the plains of Abraham, 1763, there is this proclamation given by King George III on the advice of his many advisors, including a very important Indian agent by the name of Sir William Johnson. And basically, the, appro the approach in the Royal Proclamation is we're not going to continue, we're not going to fight the indigenous peoples. Our colonies in North America are not going to be valuable unless we can persuade the indigenous people to sort of join British North America with some protection, some assurance that their lands will be protected and if at any time any of the said Indians should be inclined to dispose of the said lands, they should be purchased for us in our name at some public meeting. I'm quoting directly there from the Royal Proclamation. So there are guarantees made to the indigenous peoples. The interior of North America is reserved to the Indians as their hunting ground. And then there is a, a, a provision. We know that there will be expanding settlement going into the West, but we will do so in an orderly fashion. Indian people will have to consent. And this is a huge step, I think, in the history of democracy and the history of international law, the idea that you're kind of outlawing conquest and saying there, there has to be consent for this expansion of the Euro-American settlements into the, into the West. And this was uh, rejected by many Anglo-Americans who were in a hurry to develop, say, the Ohio Valley into private land, into real estate. Uh, one of their key land speculators was Benjamin Franklin. Another one is George Washington. Uh, okay, well, well uh, now wait a second here. So. I mean, for everything that we've heard of Benjamin Franklin and George Washington, and these are certainly two very famous names, I've never heard them described as land speculators before. Oh, yes. Uh, Washington went around getting these certificates that soldiers that fought on the British side in the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War, interestingly, is remembered to this day in the United States as the French and Indian War. Why is it called the French and Indian War? Well, the French and the Indians were together as the enemies. No. So, so the British, in a, you know, as it's remembered in the United States, they fought the French and the Indians. They were victorious and they expected to be able to take the lands that they conquered and, and, and get rich on it. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin took these certificates, these land certificates, as given as payment to British soldiers, and he, he started doing land deals, land speculation deals, and the, really the most, one of the, the, the key figure in the land speculation deals was Benjamin Franklin, 
who uh, you know printed maps, Indian treaty maps, and he was uh, very well informed on these issues. And and so this was a huge, you know, the the the, the riches that would uh, emerge from the privatization of North America. And you know, my book is called um, "Earth into Property." This: uh, how, how would the lands of North America be transformed into private property? So there was a, a kind of split, a strategic split within the British imperial system, and those who were for conquest of Indian peoples, for pushing the western boundaries of Euro uh, Euro American settlement westward quick, quickly. And if Indians had to give way and be eliminated in the process, so be it. This is this is an issue of God's manifest destiny. Uh, you know, there's a whole th theological justification given for it. So, so the Royal Proclamation was rejected. And if you uh, read the Declaration of Independence, writ written by Thomas Jefferson. At, when you get to the end of the Declaration of Independence, you find something with uh, some wording which I see as a direct um, reference to the Royal Proclamation, which is a kind of recognition of Indian rights, uh, an effort to resolve Indian people to the British Empire. And, and rather than speaking about rights, the founders of the United States who write the American Declaration of Independence, they condemn King George for many things. The opening s statements in the Declaration of Independence, we, we all know them, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, very ennobling, highfalutin, and, you know, and indeed inspiring language. But as you read farther down, you start to get into this, it's written like a, almost like a lawyer's document, indicting King George for various things. And the last thing he's indicted for is, you know, King George did bring on the merciless Indian savages whose known means of warfare is undist undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So imagine that. that. That's in the American Declaration of Independence. Okay, now, we can all Google this, I expect, and find it there. Where yeah, are we I'm, find I'm, it? I'm, I'm not, uh, this is not fantasy. This yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so let's... So say let's, it again. Let's remind ourselves, this is the most important political manifesto in history, really, the most influential. This is the document at the roots of what we call the United States of America. And the United States of America is founded on principles that said, and say to this day, King George did bring on the merciless Indian savages whose known means of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. I see this as the beginning of the war on terror in a certain yeah, sense. Yeah, yes. Like imagine, and it describes the United States, the way it operates. Imagine that uh, Indian people just happen to be on the land that this new republic yeah. which uh, are these 13 colonies that are confederated together. And the intention is to create a polity that will, will take over this process of Western expansion. So it was sort of, we don't need the British to guide our Western expansion. And that's exactly right. They just grew up and they didn't want the British running the show when they had the power to take it over themselves. Yeah, so we'll take it over ourselves. And... Uh, and so out of this, you get a, a polity that is a, a very aggressive military polity. What is a polity? Uh, um, an entity. Um, I could say a country. I could say a state. A polity is a, just a very okay, general so. term for some, some kind of legal entity or a polity. So the United States is a polity. Canada is a polity. Lethbridge is a polity. Uh, Victoria is a polity. Uh, the Shriner, Shriners Club is a polity. I mean, it's a very flex, flexible word. Okay, okay. Uh, so but, but in States any case, I'm, I'm trying to create a picture of how the United States emerges in the world. And obviously this relationship with the indigenous peoples it's not a footnote. It's, it's very significant that the country is founded with a kind of racial profiling, a criminalization of the very people who happen to be on the resources that you're just about to take over. So and they're it's going very, to become very powerful. And, and, so and here and they it, come. Yeah, you, you incorporate all of this land and then you, you, you keep going. You keep going west and then you keep going into Hawaii, you annex Hawaii, then Spanish 
American War, you, 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 you annex uh, the Philippines. Now, I just want to go back to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and you said, basically, the British said to the, I guess they could see the growing American power, and they said to them, you've got to stop, because we're, we're saying that you cannot go into the lands to the west because they belong to the native people. Now, what did the British do? Uh, no, around no. the world in relation to Native people. I think they just got rid of them wherever they could. So was this kind of a cynical thing by King George? To well, now, when we talk about the British, I mean, there, there is no United States in 1763. And the you know the British Empire you know, starts with the English Empire. It's already by 1763. It's already you know the Pilgrim Fathers are coming in in the uh, early 1600s. There's a lot of water under the bridge. There is uh, uh, you know the colonization of India. The British colonization of India. It starts I think with uh, pr uh, giving pirates contracts saying that they can become legal. They can plunder whoever, and they can become privateers. And if you do this plunder in the ocean, why not do it on land? So you create the East India Company. And by the early 1600s, the East India Company and, and other French, uh, the French Empire is also trying to colonize India. So, so this, what, what's going on in North America and the treatment of the indigenous peoples is you know, part of a larger story. And the larger story of imperialism, of colonization, is largely one of theft, of appropriation, of extermination, of genocide, of ethnic cleansing. But in the Canadian context and in the, in the North American context, another strategy for empire building could be to make friends with the indigenous peoples, to win them over to your side, to use them in your military struggles. So in the War of 1812, for instance, so you had this new polity created the United States of America but was it really viable? It was a kind of experimental thing. The War of 1812 uh, was a key time. The indigenous peoples sided with the British imperial government against the new government of the United States because it, there, there was some protections or there was some promise of respect and uh, fair treatment in, in, in the British imperial system. So we did make treaties in, in, in Canada and treaties are being made to this day in British Columbia. Uh, when you compare what's going on in British Columbia, do you see anything like it going on in California, for instance? No, I mean California, I would say, is one of the places where genocide has been really complete. Uh, you know, there are, there are native people in California, but they mostly migrate westward from, from so other places. So what you're saying is the, the United States basically declared war on the native people who were living there and got rid of them. Uh, well, they, 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 it's, it's a complex story, and I try to tell it in some detail. Interestingly, there's a period where it's unclear which will be the higher order of government. Will it be the states, the new states, or will, will Washington, D.C. become uh, a more um, dominant authority? And we know that, in fact, Washington, D.C. did emerge as an imperial capital. And uh, so in the federal system created after the success of the American revolutionaries, the uh, power to make war with Indians or to make treaties with Indians went to the Washington government. And this was a, a way that the central government sort of guided and controlled this process of Western expansion. And I'm, I'm arguing in these texts that the treatment of indigenous peoples by the U.S. government in its process of expanding across the continent it sort of sets a pattern so that the treatment of indigenous peoples all over the world now, there, there are patterns that go back to the Indian Wars and, and the treatment of indigenous peoples. Uh, and you could say that uh, three quarters of the world's peoples have been colonized as indigenous peoples. So the experience of Indians in North America is really more representative of mo the experience of most people on the planet who have seen empire building, who have seen these imperial systems as a force coming at them, as a force, you know, imploding their, their horizons. Whereas, you know, my, my, my grandfather comes from Ireland. Uh, he went west. I, I moved uh, from Toronto to uh, Alberta to, you know, good university job. For me, 
you know, empire building has meant uh, increased horizons, expanded horizons. Uh, but for indigenous peoples, empire building has, generally speaking, contained people, contained people, eliminated people, outlawed their languages, uh, made, their, made their indigenous systems of law and custom um, irrelevant to how the system works. And, and little by little, this global system of colonization uh, has led to capitalism, imagine how important the privatization of the lands and resources of the entire Western Hemisphere. Imagine the process of little by little pushing the indigenous people off those lands, transforming those lands into private property, into titled property, into uranium mines, into silver mines, into uh, forestry systems, into hydroelectric systems. This is all commodifying uh, the lands and resources of the Western Hemisphere. And this is also going on in Africa, it's going on in Indochina, uh, and, and uh, this is a huge part of what we call capitalism, the history of capitalism. So in Earth into Property, I really try to lay this out, this transformation of the, the resources of the Earth into global capital. It's a, it's a fascinating story, a huge story. You, you set the, the stage with the United States becoming an independent nation, going westward and basically sweeping everything before it. Um, let's move into the era where the United States then takes over the world as the British Empire weakens. And the United States, always in the pursuit of democracy, liberty, and freedom, somehow takes over the rest of the world. Yeah. I start uh, volume one with the uh, World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in... Uh, That's this book. Uh, no, volume two, I'm sorry, Earth into Property. I start it with uh, an, uh, a chapter devoted to the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And uh, it was instituted, this World's Festival was instituted to celebrate the fact of 400 years since Christopher Columbus's discovery of America. And it was a huge uh, event, 27 million people attended. Uh, and at that event, you saw many of the things that would make the United States such a huge force uh, in the world in the 20th century. You saw uh, electricity, you saw mo you know, early movies, you, there was a world parliaments of religion, there were Congress after Congress on things like intellectual property, I mean, Dvorak, met with Scott Joplin and sort of predicted the future of American music. There was uh, many, many um, things going on in 1893 in Chicago that would symbolize what was uh, in store. Of course, the United States entered World War I in 1917, you know, changed the balance of power, uh, had a big role in the peace settlement. But it's really after World War II that the United States emerges as unparalleled, really, in, in terms of its global dominance. Can we so, just so, step so, back? Yeah. Let's go back to uh, the late 1920s or early 1930s, because <clears throat> when you were talking earlier, you, you put forward the idea, which I also think is correct, that what we've been told, a lot of what we're told about World War II isn't exactly what was happening. Uh, Nazi Germany was created mm -hmm. um, sort of with capitalist support or money. People who supported Hitler were around the world, including in Canada, the United States, and all over Europe. And they essentially built him up. Yeah, of course, the emergence of the Soviet Union in 1917 traumatized the capitalist system. Karl Marx's uh, work is devoted to uh, describing capitalism and describing its corruption and proposing uh, that workers of the world should unite, put aside nationalism, realize the control workers collectively have. This was adopted by Lenin and uh, made into the sort of founding doctrine of, of the Soviet Union. So this fear of communism was immediate in the United States. There was a Red Scare in 1919. People were deported. The J. Edgar Hoover came in the system. They were 
condemned um, as subversives, uh, this fear of communism, especially the fear that blacks would somehow adopt communism. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, this is a huge part of the 20th century. Of course, what the Soviet Union, a Soviet is, is a union, a trade union. So the, the idea that workers would organize and assert their collective power in the industrial process, this was horrific to people like Henry Ford. Henry Ford is one of the first uh, backers of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler has a portrait of Henry Ford in his office in, in the 1920s. Uh, Adolf Hitler writes about Henry Ford as a kind of hero in Mein Kampf. Uh, so the idea that this Soviet system might spread from the Soviet Union into the center of Europe, into Germany, this, this uh, horrified the, the plutocrats, the owners of, of, of the factories. The and the owners of the media of that day, because obviously they were able to put out this message that this other idea where, you know, people with money don't have everything, but people who work have some political power to control their lives. Uh, yeah, you, you, mean, you, you have the beginning of uh, public relations, Edward Bernays, uh, you know, the... <clears throat> Sigmund Freud's um, nephew comes up with this phrase, public relations, and you know, it, it starts to become necessary to mobilize public opinion. But what, let, let's look at uh, how uh, this fear that communism, that Soviet system would move into Germany, led uh, the top industrialists of the United States, uh, starting with Henry Ford, but then uh, General Motors develops uh, industry, to, puts factories in Germany. Uh, there's a funneling of money from Wall Street to build up uh, the regime that Adolf Hitler fronts for, that he, he, he embodies. Um, I just want you to say yeah. this again, because folks, listen to this. And this, I've read this. Uh, this is, unfortunately, it's true. It's never taught to us in our public schools. We're given a totally false story. I mean, we're given one story, but never the other. It's never mentioned in the media. We grow up and never it, hear it's it. It's very well documented. It's very well documented. Uh, Ed, but Edwin the Black never writes hears a book about called it. IBM and the Holocaust, for instance. So the U.S. company IBM uh, develops the card system, the computer system that is used in you know counting Jews and keeping track of where they are and you know it was a huge bookkeeping issue the holocaust included you know bookkeeping matters and yeah. and IBM did the work uh, Standard Oil. Standard Oil worked, you know, was very involved in this huge uh, industrial complex in Germany called IB Farben. One of IB Farben's agencies started Auschwitz. Auschwitz started as a, as a uh, camp to transform coal into aviation fuel. It needed slave labor. And uh, it started as a private company in a way. Uh, Standard it was private Oil. As, Standard yeah. Oil was with I. G. Farben. And Standard I. G. Oil Farben today had, is uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, commercial economic relations in every country in the world. It's, uh, it does pharmaceuticals. It does plastics. German scientists were quite uh, progressive in terms of uh, using p uh, petrochemicals and in new and in innovative ways. So this was financed by the United States, by Wall Street, or by the top power brokers. I mean, you, you look at what was going on in the United States, where you had a social democrat, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with his New Deal, trying to empower or bring labor unions into the industrial process of, 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 of labor negotiations and industrial relations. You have, uh, you know, it's the beginning of a social si social security system, a social safety network. I mean, it didn't go that far, but it, it really was a uh, it was an effort to save capitalism, but to make capitalism to you know because you're in the depression, and 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 so how would you make capitalism more viable? How would you ease these sort of uh, bust and boom cycles? So that was what was going on in the United States, and, it, and, and there was another approach to capitalism in Germany, which is, you know, we don't want uh, labor unions, we don't want the Soviet system at all. So 
building up the, the war machine that was fronted by the voice of this regime was Adolf Hitler, but he wasn't alone. It took, you know, he, he had a huge amount of help. He was saying things that a lot of people wanted to hear. And, you know, bottom line is he was anti-communist. And he was going to, and he, he, he mixed in this... Jewish conspiracy theory that somehow communism was a Jewish plot, and you know we know the implications of that. But he was uh, doing and saying things that w got the support of the of the the big families in, in the United States who were kind of hostile, like the Duponts, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, you know the the Alcoa aluminum, you know building up the the the, the uh, Air Force in in Nazi Germany. This is, you know, the, the, the U.S. companies were on both sides of the, of the war in, in, in that instance. And once uh, Adolf Hitler was defeated by the Soviet Union, it was really the Soviet Union, you know, his, his, his expansionary policies, his effort to uh, seize out and grab Lebensraum in the east. Which means living room. Which Ooh. means living room. And he, he actually had read all about how the United States had expanded westward and how it had decimated and pushed aside the indigenous peoples. And Adolf Hitler looked at the Slavs of Russia. He actually called them the Redskins. So this was one of his examples. He was, he was doing what fellow Nordics had done in, in, the, in the building of, uh, of the United States of America. And so, when you say that the Soviet Union defeated uh, Nazi Germany, which it did, I mean, it was done at massive cost. Uh, the Soviet Tens Union. of millions of people killed in the Soviet Union. Uh, cities devastated. Ah, uh, oh, the pain mm. and the suffering that these p poor people yeah. had to go through. Something that, and and who fund again? Who was fund? Because the, the the Americans were giving stuff to the Russians as well. Well, I mean, let's remember that Stalin was I the ally of Roosevelt and Churchill. Oh, the you know that that in World War II. Our British imperial system, the U.S. system, we were with Stalin. So this but, was... But, uh, but we were also funding... But this was covert, and as you Hitler. say... That, <laughs> I mean, the real job of Hitler, he was built up, was to take that uh, ram at the Soviet Union. Maybe the Soviet Union, you know, maybe that was the beginning of the demise of the Soviet Union. The, the huge um, assault... Uh, you know, they, they prevailed, recovered. maybe they never recovered. Uh, in any case, this, uh, the, the Nazi system of anti-communism was very much taken in by the CIA. Uh, 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 John Foster Dulles, his brother Alan, was head of the CIA. They hired, for instance, the, the German anti-communist, anti-Soviet spy network in Eastern Europe, the Galen uh, Group. Uh, many of the scientists, you know, Ver Werner von Braun is a famous one, but uh, much of the uh, Nazi science was taken into the U.S. corporate structures. So by this time, uh, uh, Roosevelt was gone, and, and uh, the United States then began uh, to bring into the United States, or, or to put around the world, they basically rescued a lot of the Nazis from Germany. Yeah, and of course, when Since they were when, working with them and paying them, uh, the, by this time they have a, a monopoly on uh, this uh, atomic technology. Right. And Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you know, the decision to demonstrate the power of these atomic weapons on a civilian population in Japan, you know, obviously one of the great war crimes of all time. Uh, this was really to demonstrate to the Soviet Union that we're not going to be your friends, and you better... Because we will do it. You watch. We, yeah, and it's the, to this day, the United States is the only power on Earth that's, well, they will do it. They've proven they, they're willing to, to do it. Yes, but it was uh, done to save lives. That's, that's what we were, yeah. we Even were told. Even though Japan was surrendering. So, so, in a way, this use of the Third Reich to, to be the spearhead in the defense vis-a-vis uh, -vis communism, you know, European communism, and after World War II, the United States just takes up that same theme. They are going to be the spearhead and the primary shield vis-a-vis -vis communism, international co communism, international proletarianism. And, so and the sword and shield of, uh, of the capitalists and, and, and the billionaire families. I mean, they're not yeah, well, of course, you know, to oppose the Soviet Union and to oppose its, 
its uh, communist system is to advance capitalism. So uh, this is a period, uh, this period of the Cold War, this superpower rivalry between the communist system, the Soviet Union, the capitalist system, the U.S.-led. This, this dominates the second half of the 20th century. Roosevelt's um, approach is preempted by Truman, who says, you know, we're going to treat the uh, Soviet Union as the enemy. We're going to have a national security state. 1947, uh, uh, they pass the National Security Act, create the CIA, and basically create this whole um, structure, kind of take over the, the British Empire and other empires, move into that vacuum. And, uh, but now, empire building, it's, it's informal. It's not uh, formal like it was before the Second World War and the British Empire you and the French when, Empire. When on the map it, it showed that uh, here is here is the British Empire. We own these countries, and and, that's and in the way these it is. countries you would have an outright governor, yes, who was answerable to the British government, not the local people. Uh, whereas you do, you didn't get that in the U.S. Empire, but what you did get is when uh, leaders arose, for instance, in Congo. The person, the first prime president of Congo after the Belgians pulled out, his name was Patrice Lumumba, and he was a postal worker, a trade unionist, and, and he rose up, and uh, when the Belgians were leaving, he, he said to the applause of people in Congo, you know, we're not your monkeys anymore. And he was quite popular with his, his people, and, and he was building a sort of Congolese national movement, national consciousness. And part of his policies, he wanted to nationalize natural resources. So when you say self-determination, you know, we have all these uh, international laws and protocols referring to the importance of the self-determination of peoples. But when, uh, uh, when decol the decolonized move movement would extend to leaders actually proposing to nationalize natural resources, the oil, the gas, the diamonds, and you know, huge wealth in the Congo, coal ton, which is so important for cell phones and all kinds of communication networks. Uh, he was, uh, like uh, he, him and others, whenever they proposed to take over natural resources, they were called communists, and they were eliminated one way or other, sometimes assassinated. What happened to Patrice Lumumba? So Patrice Lumumba was murdered. He was murdered by his opponents, who were backed by the CIA, the British intelligence, the Belgian government. He was eliminated, and in his place was uh, emerged this uh, dictator, Mobutu, Desiree Mobutu. He called himself Sesi Seiko, and he would murder his opponents. He would torture his opponents. Uh, he was a kleptocrat, a very you know wealthy individual who kind of took care of the store, took care of the resources for um, these global companies, these mining companies, including Canadian companies. So I was in Congo in 1971 and witnessed this. And I'd come into Congo from Uganda, where Idi Amin was in power. And there's another dictator who was put in place to, in a, in a, in a way, preempt the the promise of decolonization, the reality that these European empires were exhausted, they weren't going to continue governing the indigenous peoples. Theoretically, the indigenous peoples would choose their own leaders and their own policies, but that didn't happen. In the name of the Cold War, the, the U.S. companies, with the military backing and the counterintelligence networks and the hit squads and whatnot, they covertly manipulated all the governments of the world, and I'm sure including Canada's, to, uh, to be in conformity with the interests of their big companies. They're, trans, you know, they're enabling their, their multinational com companies to become increasingly global. So I, I just, I'm just going to interrupt and say, this is the reality of where we are at. It's got nothing to do with what you're told in, in, in the school books, and it's got nothing to do with what the media story always is. Uh, it's, that's, that's nothing. What you're hearing here is the truth. We have to oppose it here in Canada. This is, uh, we have to retake our democracy. 
We have to find out what's been going on in our world. And if this is what we want, then okay, then this is what we want. But we should know the truth about our history and the history of the world because it's got nothing, because we're, they've got us in the next wars now. We're fighting in Afghanistan for democracy, right? Well, you know, we're, we're subject to this constant uh, doses of mythology, fantasy, really. Um, so, you know, we're, the, we're, the, we're for democracy, we're for freedom, we're for enlightenment, uh, never mind that these uh, wars of aggression are you know, pumping out death and destruction. Uh, in the name of democracy. I mean, we're given this fantasy. Uh, so the Cold War, a big part of the Cold War, was psychological warfare. And the media companies have increasingly become central to the Cold War machinery. And think what happened with the demise of the Soviet Union, starting with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And then one day to the next, almost, suddenly there is no such thing as the Soviet Union. So the Soviet enemy had justified this enormous buildup of military resources, of covert uh, agencies, you know, CIA operatives, uh, militarization of space. Uh, you know, the, the, a huge amount of the U.S. economy is devoted to the war machine. So since 1941, you've had this buildup of a permanent war economy. So. The United States starts in World War II building up its war economy. After the peace, it doesn't stop building up that war economy. The Soviet Union is there. The Soviet Union is depicted in a way that it's such a major threat, and it justifies building up all, all, all of this armaments, arsenals, but also psychological vessels to contaminate our thinking, to cause us to see our other human beings as somehow less than human. And thus, uh, they can be eliminated because they're the enemy and, and, and we represent the good and the light and the freedom and they represent uh, the savage. And, you know, I take you back to where I started with this, that the United States is founded on this demonization of the merciless Indian savages. You know, I see that as, it, in, a, in a sense, the founding statement of the global war on terror. There's got to be an enemy. It's first the Indians, it's the Redcoats, then it's the Red Communists. Think of uh, the system after the disappearance of the Soviet Union. Where's the enemy? How do you justify continuing this permanent war economy, continuing this system of you know, concentrating wealth in very few hands and much of the wealth that exists is related to controlling these military companies and this, this vast array of uh, But of, it gives capital. them control of everything. Their, their poor young men are now off fighting wars again around the world because of 9-11. So 9-11, how convenient that just as the system, you know, the, the possibility of peace, of a global peace, there is no real central contention anymore with the demise of the Soviet Union. What's going to happen to all those cold warriors? What's going to happen to those millions and millions of people whose whole economy's way of life have, have been geared to fighting this enemy? So uh, this creation of a new enemy, I think that's so important to understand the context of 9-11 and what I call the emergence of the privatized or development of the privatized terror economy. It, you know, it's, it's perpetuating a system that will not allow itself to die. And if, if you think, well, was it just uh, 19 dudes with box cutters with Osama bin Laden planning this in a cave in Afghanistan? I mean, how convenient that all this was supposedly planned in caves in the very location where you're building your pipelines. <laughs> and you've got you know, all this investment once, uh, you know, no longer is the U.S. building cars and making things like it did over, you know, the early years after World War, or the early decades and, after and, World War and II. you know, you're saying 9-11, but clearly this happened with the total complicity of what I call the corporate media. Because the evidence that has grown up over the last nine years about what happened on 9-11 is so overwhelming that the official story cannot possibly be true. And yet the uh, yeah, media will uh, never mention it. Well, uh, and uh, you know, and people are leaving the uh, commercial media in droves. 
And I encourage them to because it, you know, it's, it's very insulting looking at the National Post, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, and just seeing the extent of the lies. It's on the CBC, it's on the BBC, it's on CBS. Let's remember that the, the, these agencies of propaganda are at the very core of the war machine. And oftentimes, the companies are actually owned by armaments companies. Uh, you know, Westinghouse or General Electric, for instance, which make weapons. So, so the, the, you know, these are not, the, the, there's an interest in depicting the world in a certain way that justifies building up arms, that justifies the demonization of whole populations, Arab and Muslim peoples, uh, have been demonized. And so when we, when we get news about drones going into communities in Pakistan's robotic uh, killing machines, where some kid in uh, Florida is playing at a computer screen, sending an actual weapon that kills indiscriminately in a town. It doesn't, a drone doesn't say, oh, there's an Al-Qaeda, boom, 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 oh, there's some school kids, we'll leave them. Uh, uh, how is this possible? It's possible because our minds have been poisoned so that we don't really see the people receiving those, that weaponry as fully human. That, well, they're terrorists or they're, they're giving birth to these terrorists. I mean, I take this back to the merciless Indian savages, the Uni United States has needed an enemy. It needs an enemy to justify its expansion. I see the global war on terror as sort of continuing this process of appropriating natural resources from indigenous peoples. It used to be on the claim that they were savages, that they weren't civilized, that we would bring them civilization, we would bring them Christianity. Now it's, well, they're terrorists. There are failed states. Uh, so, 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 so the lies and mythology are, are, are immense. And, uh, you know, I would, as you say, the history books don't tell us this. And, well, these, these books are published by McGill Queen's University Press. They're peer reviewed. And there, there are people in the world who so are when working you say hard on, on changing this, uh, this mythological account that doesn't enable people to really know where we stand, what, it, what are our true conditions in, in this society. When you say peer reviewed, you mean that the information in the book has been looked over by other experts in the field, and basically they're saying that, yes, you, you have a, in the an academy, argument here. Yeah, in the academy, peer review is kind of the gold standard. So uh, the, the publisher will um, send out the manuscript to uh, experts in the field, and uh, it's anonymous. I, I'm not to know who those experts are, so it's a protection that it won't just be political. You know, you, somebody criticized me, I'll get them next time. You know, you scratch my back, I, I scratch your back. There's an effort in the academy with this peer review system, anonymous peer review, to uh, get some integrity. Uh, so these books have gone through that process. So they're coming out from, you know, you've heard of McGill, you've heard of Queens. These are not... Uh, marginal institutions, they're mainstream institutions, and uh, this is a, a project of 16 years for me, and, and uh, I've done this within the academy. I, I talk about 9-11, I don't accept the official conspiracy theory that we've been given as uh, representative of what happened on 9-11. Any serious person who can read and research on the internet, I think, understands that there's enormous problems with the official story of what happened in 9-11. But I feel rather alone in the academy. There's not too many professors who are, you know, going into their jobs every day, teaching students, uh, uh, talking about this subject. There are some, uh, uh, Michael Kiefer at the University of Guelph, uh, John McMurtry, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, uh, Graham McQueen, he founded Peace Studies at, at McMaster. Uh, I'm, you know, this is not a 9-11 book, but people who are interested in that subject will find that topic addressed why I don't accept the official uh, conspiracy theory of 19 dudes from Saudi Arabia with box cutters. Uh, to say it's an inside job, can I say who did it? No, I can't interpret the whole thing. I would say Dick Cheney is certainly high up on the list of suspects who should be talked to because the president is being pulled away on the 9-11. He, he, he ends up in the bunker sort of directing the whole system underneath the Cheney White House, up Dick Cheney, yes, and, and yes. Bush is off in grade two. Yeah, and then, and then he doesn't go back to Washington. He's pulled further into the Midwest 
with Cheney left. Uh, sort Imagine of, the power these people have to pull these kinds of things off. Well, you know, we we my 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 guess is something went wrong on nine eleven. Uh, it, it didn't unfold fully as it was supposed to, but you know, it's one of the great. It's sort of the the common people know it's out there and you know so, so the 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 media who spins us every day this story al qaeda this al qaeda this do they tell us who al qaeda is that al qaeda emerges from within the cia system that you know it's not, it, there may be an external element to it but it's not entirely external uh no we're we're, we're just given this picture of this external enemy uh that comes from somewhere else. Um, and of course, you know, there's been so much um, subversion of the system, the privatization of the CIA, of the counterintelligence. I mean, fear and the marketing of fear has become a big business. Uh, if you have enough fear, you can sell security. So our, our whole economy now is, you know, continuing after the Soviet Union, it turns out that our, our military budgets are even bigger. And, uh, you know, and the propaganda is, is far more grotesque than during the, the Cold War. And we've now begun the funding of private armies out of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, the public is paying for the creation of private armies like Blackwater, who now under a different yeah. name. And, and we, in Canada, we're, and uh, other countries, are, we're getting a law that if you criticize the government of Israel, which is a very militaristic type of government, you'll be anti-Semitic. And that is you know, really on. Uh, now I don't that, think that we is, can say we're getting that law. There is a discussion in Parliament uh, going on. Well, it's obviously leading towards that. France has that. Uh, you know, you you France? have France is such a thing. So I understand. Uh, when you so so, so <laughs> little by little, it's there's an effort to criminalize certain sorts of thought, certain sorts of inquiry. And we saw that in Toronto recently at the G8 and G20. Yes. Um, people, innocent people were, I mean, this is, uh, this doesn't happen a lot in Canada, but yeah. hundreds of totally innocent people were arrested by the police and the military, put in, some would call them torture situations for hours or a day or maybe a bit longer for a few, quite all of it very deliberately. Um, nothing in the media out here, maybe it's talked about in Toronto, but there's nothing in the media, it was just done. I mean, is there an inquiry? Are we now, are the corporations and their governments now saying to the people of Canada that if you even go near a demonstration, uh, you could be arrested? And I, I, I watched the, this, these large demonstrations at the Battle of Seattle in 1999, you know, as, as this project was just developing. And as I saw the people mobilizing to question the increased authority of the World Trade Organization, as I saw them mobilizing, I thought, you know, this movement needs an understanding of its historical roots. It's a very important movement. And the people who've been imposing imperial globalization since 1492, the indigenous peoples, it seems to me they have a, you know, a particularly powerful role to play in sort of leading this movement. Uh, I use that word, the fourth world. An uh, Indian man in uh, uh, British Columbia came up with that phrase to speak of uh, a vision of how to oppose you know, the, this uh, lie of the Cold War that there are only two systems. Uh, a capitalist system and the communist system, and you have to choose between those and get over your underdevelopment by going down one or the other path of development. Uh, in any case, this, this rise of a protest movement, you know, it, it, there needs to be, uh, first in the name of, well, they called it anti-globalization, but it seemed to me that was strategically wrong. What, you know, how can you be against globalization? We live on a globe, and don't we want to have good communications with our fellow human beings and reciprocity and trade? You, know, you don't want to find yourself being a, like a Luddite and saying, I'm anti-globalization. We want you know, better globalization. We want anti-imperial globalization. We don't want corporate globalization. We want ecological globalization. I mean, there's different ways to think about Democratic globalization. Democratic globalization. Yeah. Maybe some kind of federal model yes. for humanity, for all of humanity. So um, It's interesting. One thing I noticed about the whole democratic globalization movement, which reared its head at Seattle and was huge, and what I remember 
most about that is that the people running that show, and they were around the world, were pointing at the corporations and saying, we can see the problems around the world and we know who's to blame. And, yeah. it's, and it's you. It's you, the corporation, and we want change. Following that came 9-11. Yeah. And then that was the end of the of the entire movement. It disappeared. On the on the way to that uh, came Quebec City in um, spring of two thousand and one. I went with. Uh, there were tens of thousands of post secondary students, and I'm proud to say I ended up in penitentiary, Orsonville Penitentiary. I'm proud of the fact that I participated in pulling down the fence that was put around at Quebec City. And you know we had a movement going. Uh, I, I think that fence was illegal. It set a precedent. It was a minimum display of force that the people aren't going to tolerate something as outrageous, for instance, as claiming the whole downtown core of a city on a given day as the private property of, of some regime yet to be invented. You know, the free trade area of the Americas, like expanding NAFTA into a larger network. Then came 9-11, and all of that was just blasted away. But you know, at uh, the G20 protests, they blame everything on the black bloc. And I saw that in Quebec City. I wanted to be <laughs> recognized for pulling that fence down. Instead, it was all in the papers. It was this anarchist group, a faces, faceless anarchist group known as the black bloc, le bloc noir. Uh, now I see it at the G20. I mean, th this is a, this is a, a police-created apparatus like Al Qaeda is 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 that you know, like Taliban. We use these words: the enemy are Al Qaeda, they're Taliban, they're Black Bloc, uh, and and there's just a kind of a, a very simplistic idea. Do do we know? Do we get any real uh, faces, any real articulation from these things? No, no, they're just crazy. They hate our freedoms. They're anarchists. They're psycho. They just want destruction for destruction's sake. This Tony, mythology that's Tony, built Tony, you've brought us into basically uh, the era we are living in and the, almost the day we are living in right now. But we're going to have to stop because we're out of time. Okay. So thank you very much. I, I think for anybody who's watched any of this, you've gotten, you know, a... a some points of view about what's really going on that we've got to think about because uh, unfortunately they may be true. <laughs> so give your well, you know, don't we uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, check it out. It's Earth into Property: Colonization, Decolonization, and Capitalism. It's been out for just a couple of weeks, uh, and uh, the earlier volume, which won uh, the book for best nonfiction in Alberta in uh, 2004, The American Empire and the Fourth World. That's uh, volume one and volume two of The Bowl with One Spoon. Thanks for watching Face to Face. Mm -hmm.